Hello and welcome to Never Mind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. Welcome also to former Liberal Democrat MP, current professor and one of the party's leading thinkers, David Howarth. Welcome to the show, David. Uh, hi, Mark. Glad to be here. Now, as I'm joined by such exalted company today, I thought I would start with a nice and easy question. So what do you reckon the future is for liberalism here in the UK after all of the successes, frankly, for the populist right in recent years? Are you optimistic, pessimistic about the outlook for liberalism now? Well, I always say I'm hopeful, but not optimistic. <laughs> um, so so ho hopeful in the sense that things could be different. There's something to work for. Um, the situation is not hopeless. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and we have to hang on to the possibility that things could, could be better, better than we can work for a better society. But um, I'm not unrealistic about the prospects. I'm, I'm not optimistic in the sense of thinking everything's going to turn out for the, for the best. Um, the situation really is very, very um, serious. I, mean, I think it's probably worth saying that liberalism is not an end state. It's not a, it's not a utopia. You know, there's no such thing as the the final stage of liberal liberalness and then when you reach it you can just relax um, it's a it's a constant never-ending task really, liberalism. Um, you know the establishment and preservation of people's freedoms um, especially the freedom to live their own lives to be able to pursue their own conception of what it is to lead a good life and um, uh, protecting that from all the dangers that exist is, is a constant task and there are more dangers to that than I think there's been for, for quite a while. I guess I am a bit more optimistic than you probably for two reasons one of which may age horribly or not which is I just I do think the global situation will look massively better or worse depending on whether Biden or Trump wins um, not only I think because of the difference between having Biden or Trump as president but also if all of the ways that Trump has behaved in the last three and a half years culminates in him losing an election, I think the verdict will be very different in terms of, oh, well, actually, thank goodness, it turns out all of that sort of awful behaviour in the end does lose you an election. You know, that will actually almost be a reassuring <laughs> uh, verdict. Um, I dread to think what it will feel like, obviously, if Trump wins. But I think, you know, I, I, I think people perhaps underestimate both ways just what big an impact it may have on, on, on people's views of the future, what happens in the US presidential election. Normally, we overfocus on the US, actually. But I think in this case, that just psychological feeling of, of oh, thank goodness, or oh, my goodness, um, is quite significant. The other, though, reason for my... I guess, slightly greater optimism. It does feel to me like the events of the last couple of years have really highlighted the continuing need and role for liberalism in a way that there have been, particularly at moments of doubt over the prospects of the Liberal Democrats as a political party in the past, um, or indeed, you know, our predecessors, there have sometimes been that sort of existential, just what's the point of that take on political philosophy does it have a role whilst i think if you look at many of the issues thrown up by coronavirus it feels like the liberal versus non-liberal debate is very much a, a relevant and contemporary one well i, I agree with your second point mm. the, the 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 need for the liberal viewpoint and, and for liberal politics and for uh, liberalism as this never-ending task is, is is greater than ever um, but i'm not sure i agree with your first point um, you're right that normally we over-emphasize um, American politics. Um, I think you're probably doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, American politics is kind of big in the British media. I'm not sure it's that, that big in the world. Um, we need to worry about the rise of authoritarianism more broadly yeah. um, in terms of China, for example, especially. Um, but also, even looking at the US, um, um, you know, if Trump gets more than 45% of the vote, in, which would mean he would lose heavily. Mm. Still, forty-five percent of the vote in in, in a, a, a very big and important country. Mm. And also, the, the 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 underlying forces that brought Trump to power, the the, the, mm. the power of money, mm. of big money in the in, in gigantic amounts mm. uh, coming out of certain quarters in the U.S. That's still there. Mm. 
And uh, the question then is, where does it go next? And what does it try to do next? Its main aim is basically to destroy democratic politics because that gets in the way of making even more money. And I can't really see um, the, def the one-off defeat of Trump uh, defeating that effort. Uh, so I, I think that's there, and I think China's still there. I think you, you, you're probably right in the short term that, that um, we might have gone beyond the, the, the high point of authoritarian nationalist populism. Mm -hmm. um, certainly true that um, in countries where populism isn't that strong anyway, it's now weakening. So, so in Germany, we, which is never the best breeding ground in, in you know, modern times for populism, um, uh, recent polling shows um, uh, populist attitudes on the wane, mm. especially among um, uh, the more general electorate. Um, and just on Germany, I mean, it's worth reflecting that's, I think, a particularly cheery, you know, uh, point from the liberal perspective, because also Germany, you know, you know, full credit to Angela Merkel, you know, I think she did something a lot of uh liberal politicians would have been quite wary of doing in terms of welcoming so many immigrants into germany in recent years and although she took a big political hit for that in the short run and there was an upsurge in populism actually it now seems to be settling down to both she is much more popular again that populist wave has has ebbed and it's possible to be in that sense both pro-immigration and socially and economically and politically successful and in that sense germany is quite a hopeful example yeah that's right i, I think um, um there are examples where things have gone a bit better than, mm -hmm. than here uh, or in, in the us um and germany is certainly one of those the ideological basis of, of german politics is always very kantian mm -hmm. based on you know, the, 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 the sovereign individual um and the um the way that's played out in the coronavirus um, episode is really important, which is that um, the basis of, of Merkel's policy, if you listen to her speeches, is that everybody counts. Every, every individual counts. That, that there's not this um, uh, trade-off where, where some individuals don't count. It doesn't really matter if people die, if other people make money, um, which is, I think, been the basis of, 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 of our politics, uh, but even more so um, politics in the U.S. Mm. I, I guess your reference to China, again, interestingly, I, I take, I guess, a slightly more optimistic view of that, because I think for two reasons. One is, although India is a deeply imperfect democracy, it is interesting to see how India is sort of now, in some ways, where China was 20 or 30 years ago, in the sense of it is a growing uh, international force. And, in, and increasingly butting up in rivalry against other countries and so on. But actually, India is a democracy, albeit a somewhat you know, troubled democracy, but it is a, a long running. And, and that sense of, well, the wave of the future involves another powerful democracy being a player, feels that overall is probably a good move, un unlike how it felt previously, where often people were prognosticating about the rise of you know, authoritarian countries dominating the future of the world. And the other thing which I just find puzzling um, about China is it does seem to me that the Chinese government is being an awfully lot less successful with its foreign policy now than it was a few years ago. You know, if you think that a few years ago, people like George Osborne were desperately keen to secure huge Chinese investment in the UK. And not only that George Osborne was keen on that, but generally that was seen as a good thing, you know, not by anti-capitalists, uh, or anti-globalists, but across the broad political spectrum, that idea of engaging with China, securing Chinese investment was, you know, uncontroversial or positive. And the well, Chinese, China's you know, the Chinese from... government has taken a massive reputational hit in the last two or three years, hasn't it? Yeah, that's right. China has moved from soft power to hard power. Mm. But the, the point is, it's got the hard power. And the, um, and, and the question is how to resist the rise of and the success of um, authoritarian nationalism. And, that, and that's the basis of China's um, stance. It is an authoritarian yeah. nationalist uh, but, but its ability to exercise hard power is much more restrained than, say, Russia, isn't it? So, I mean, in terms of, for example, Hong Kong, clearly there is an ability to exercise hard power there. 
but if you look at the number of places Russia has intervened sort of through cyber and and sort of troops on the ground interventions you know China isn't surrounded by other places where it can intervene in, in a hard power way it, it does feel to me it's quite a cul-de-sac in a way the route that the Chinese well, government I mean, is, it is taking. doesn't need to it's a very big place mm. uh, but but the um What's going on in the South China Sea is the extension of military mm. influence and power. I mean, it's just the, the extension of bases. Um, and you'll, I think you'll see a kind of imperialistic expansion over the next 10 years of getting uh, naval bases um, set up in, in other countries. And, 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 you know, we, it's now following a, 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 a pretty set path for imperial. Mm. Well, I, 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 yeah, I, I guess we will. We should do a uh, a reprise in ten years' time because 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 your reference to sort of bases in other countries, I guess, what makes me, um, again, add, adds to my sort of optimism is that sense of actually China is putting off rather than winning over other countries, and in that sense, it feels like it is, you know, other countries in Asia which have numerous disagreements amongst themselves, off you know, for all sorts of reasons, often. Um, there is much less of a sense of, well, there are the pro-Chinese countries that are being successfully wooed and won over. It's more that China is putting others off. Um, well, I, yeah, I, I think the, I'd put it slightly differently, mm. which is that if you shift to a hard power policy and just exerting your mm. power over other countries, uh, it becomes less of a model for other people to follow. Exactly, yeah. You can only have one China. Mm. Um, so, so, so the... The idea of emulating China um, will, I, th I think you're right, not be so attractive. But being afraid of it might mm. well go in the opposite direction. And it's obviously a lot easier to be more sanguine about the impact of being afraid of it from a long yeah. distance away, like both of us yeah. are in talking about it, definitely. But um, so having sort of roamed across the different oceans, having talked about the US and China, um, heading back home, what what's your take on what all of this means for the Liberal Democrats more specifically and sort of prosaically, I guess, in our little corner of the world? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing to pick up on is the thing we agreed on, which is the, there's, there's more of a need than ever for, for a Liberal Party, for a party to you know, fight against the concentrations of wealth and power uh, and to fight for people's ability to live their own lives. Um, undominated by those uh, concentrations of wealth and power. That, that's certainly um, what the party should be doing. We're a party of values, not a party of interests or manoeuvre. I know Nick Clegg thought we might be a party of manoeuvre, but you've got to be good at manoeuvring to be a party of manoeuvre. Do you want to just unpack um, what, those, what those three options are for, for listeners who are newer to the, that terminology? Well, a, a party of values is a party which, which, which is in politics, promote a view of how politics should work and how um, um, the, the society should be moving in what direction um, based on political values. The, um, a, a party of interest is, is a party that represents a group of people within society and, and pushes forward those people's interests. I mean, that's classically the Labour Party's view of itself um, is a party of working people. Um, and a party manoeuvre is a party that just does whatever is necessary to take and hold power, which is the uh, traditional stance of the Conservative Party, although, although I, it, perhaps not anymore. But, but it, for, the, for the most part, the Conservative Party has been a party of manoeuvre. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think in many ways, the, the Tories probably still are, because that's how you can explain the way that um you know breaking the law being found by the supreme court to be overstepping your powers etc you know that's the sort of thing that previous versions of a conservative party would have been appalled by a government so overstepping its power that it gets slapped down by the supreme court whilst the current iteration of the conservative party seems to relish and almost view it as a virtue to have judges disagreeing with it so i, I think that sort of sense of party manoeuvre is very much with with at least yeah, so well, i think that's I mean. possibly a, a, a part of the conservatives turn to be a party of values they're just not values that we like <laughs> um, and so, so, so the, the present conservative party seems to have abandoned um all sorts of things like look actually were quite attractive in conservatism the, the kind of oak shotian conservatism where you say well we don't want to pursue abstract goals we don't think that um 
uh, uh, chasing after utopias is a very sensible idea and usually leads to disaster. And uh, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better for people just to stick to what they've got and to hang on to you know, what can be enjoyed in, 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 in life as it's lived now and um, um, not get lost in abstraction. That, that sort of uh, conservative party, which is a proper conservative mm. party, believes in conservatism and you know, conserving stuff, um, I think it's gone. Mm. Um, and, and it's been replaced by um, two sorts of ideology, uh, nationalist authoritarian ideology and uh, hard libertarianism, the hard right libertarianism. And um, um, what maneuver there is, is maneuver, uh, opportunist maneuver, just, just uh, tr trying to grab hold of votes based on uh, short term uh, popularity. But, but, but most of the, their maneuvering is within one or the other of those ideological frames, the nationalist authoritarian yeah. frame or the libertarian one. And usually these days, it's the nationalist authoritarian one. So it's basically the Tory party has become the Brexit party, um, which, um, you know, I've got lots of, I'm, I'm not one of those um, uh, people um, who came into politics because I hated conservatives or hated anybody in particular. Um, although I know there are some in the Lib Dems and especially in the Labour Party. Um, so I got on with, I have got on with over the years, lots of conservatives. Um, um, but they're not conservatives of the new type. They're conservatives of the old type, the old Shottian type. And those people feel lost, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's, there's no political party at all that, 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 that um, they feel has anything to do with them. Yeah, and, and I guess that, that raises a question about where us in the Lib Dems should seek to pitch our electoral tent in the future, because um, one answer to that um, is to say, yeah, there are all of those, you know, traditional commuter belt, middle class professionals who quite value things like the rule of law and so on, but, you know, have probably quite like stability, but also have a social conscience um who i think particularly feel a little bit aimless it politically homeless looking at the modern conservative party you know to what extent it's that sort of voter that, that the lib dems should go for um i i guess you know one way of looking at it is it's to what extent are seats like isha and walton uh where you know which we just failed to win in 2019 to take it off dominic grab what to what extent are places like that really the heart of the future for the lib dems or is that ending up too much a bit like Nick Clegg's pursuit? That, of, yeah, that's, that's, that's right too many Where there, there are you're not enough that, voters and even yeah, three seats. If you go it. down that route as a party of value, you lose all of your voters. Um, so, so the people, it, we just haven't realised as a fact that there are people looking for new homes, um, but we shouldn't change what we believe in to attract them. Otherwise, it becomes pointless being a, the type of political party we are. Um, but it, it's a... Um, I, the, the point I was trying to make was a slightly different one, which, which is that um, given the Conservative Party as it is now, mm. not as it was, um, it is a danger. It's a danger to our country. It's a danger to liberal values. It's a danger to freedom in general. Um, and um, I wouldn't have said this previously, in previous decade, decades. I've been actually against saying it. But I think it is worth saying now that, 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 that one of the goals of the party ought to be to remove the conservatives, this conservative party, not um, perhaps the same as the old conservative party, but remove this conservative party from office. And is that different from how you felt about, say, the major government in the 1990s? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Complete, uh, in fact, um, the, the, when people were, were, were getting very excited about getting rid of the Tories under John Major, this, this always seemed to be... A, you know, slightly exaggerated point of view, <laughs> but um, but nevertheless, I think now it's different. It, it, this is a very different Conservative Party. This is a very dangerous party, and so in these circumstances, as we now find ourselves, um, the making a goal for our politics of, of, of just removing this government, I think, is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. And what does that mean? I mean, my reason for asking about the 1990s is obviously one of the sort of standard comments being made in the party now is essentially that we should look to repeat the night, you know, what Paddy did in the 1990s. Uh, obviously, particularly culminating in 
1997 general election in which we gained lots of seats clearly that would be a good thing to emulate at the next general election but also more specifically that sense that we should basically say we want the current government out and that also means that although the Labour Party are our rivals and opponents in many ways there is a degree to which there's a recognised shared you know common interest that both Labour and us want the Tories out and then not to be a Tory Prime Minister. Paddy obviously took that to in the end quite an extreme position um, I think people forget you know how much he thought about whether or not the Lib Dems should merge with Labour um, but 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 there are obviously you know varying degrees along that spectrum but do you see sort of similar parallels with the 1990s then and that, that that's maybe the sort of route the party should take again? Well there's certainly lessons to learn from the 90, late 90s um, of course, I was on the Federal Policy Committee at the time and opposing Paddy's every move on this. Um, because his goal was merger. Um, you could tell it was when he denied it. <laughs> but, so, but his goal was merging the parties. And, and, and um, I, th I thought that was a mistake. Um, that wh where would we have been on the Iraq war had, we, had Paddy succeeded in merging us with Labour? There does need to be the, uh, the liberal voice and the, and the potential for a liberal voice at any point to break through. So, the, so the one, one lesson to learn is that if we're going to go down uh, the route of uh, you know, the politics of removing the conservatives, the current conservative party from power, uh, we need an exit strategy. Mm. And Paddy's exit strategy was the exit of the party from the, from the national stage. So, you need, so, so we need a different exit strategy from that. We need to, to, to be able to see um, uh, where we might be in different circumstances and, 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 and be able to extricate ourselves from, from um, a position where we might end up um, uh, supporting a government that, whose views are deeply liberal. So, that, so that's uh, one aspect of it. We need to learn from that. Um, but we also need to learn from, from, from the successes of it. I mean, the, the, um, the main success of that strategy was in the two parties, Labour and the Lib Dems, and now include the Greens in this, of course, uh, not attacking one another. And so, so, and, and, but the, attacking the, uh, the, the, the Conservatives, but then concentrating on the positive of your own message. So, you, mm. so, so it's, it, it's not coalitionism. You, you shouldn't be promoting a coalition as an inherently good idea. It's uh, attacking the Conservatives and promoting liberalism and not spending all your time saying what, what demons the other uh, mm. uh, 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 parties are. Um, and, and that has great um, um, attractions for us because I, I think one of the main reasons why we, we haven't succeeded recently is because Labour spends so much time attacking us. Mm. And, and I think uh, that Labour's attacks on us have, have been very successful. And what's more, um, that it, it, it's created the Conservative government. The, 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 the fact that strategically at the last election, Labour had a choice of, of attacking us or attacking the Conservatives, mainly attacked us, uh, which had the effect of <clears throat> delivering a massive Conservative majority. Mm. So, so, so Labour's strategic choice, and this is very important, do they really want to get rid of the Conservative government um, or do they really want to stop Lib Dems coming back? Like that? And that's the, so, so if they're going to make the, the, the choice uh, against the Conservative government on their side, then there's a, there are grounds for us doing something similar on our side and just concentrating our, our, um, uh, our tax on, on, on the Conservatives. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I guess that, you know, is one of the significance, isn't it, of Keir Starmer having taken over from Jeremy Corbyn is I think... You know, when you had a Labour leader in Corbyn who, for example, was just so, I mean, at best, hopelessly weak on anti-Semitism, you know, it seems to me there was almost a moral duty on us to criticise yeah. him over that and rather than to just say, you know, you know, walk away and stay silent. Um, yeah. So I think, and I, I'm, I've no doubt if there was someone from the Labour Party in this conversation, you know, they would partly be saying, you know, well, you know, we only attacked you because you were attacking us. You know, there's a bit of both. But I think, yeah, with under Keir Starmer, it looks like the, you know, there's an option there for us that there just wasn't under Jeremy Corbyn, which yeah, is right. absolutely to see the Labour Party as rivals and 
lots of really badly run Labour councils where, you know, we need to kick them out of the town hall. Uh, but it's possible to do that in a way that also recognises that at a general election level, we're basically, we do both want a to the Tory Prime Minister to lose power. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is possible. Um, but again, you've got to think through where you'd be if it succeeds, right? So you've got to not, not just um, aim to do it, but, but think about what happens when it works and where we're going to be then. And this it's, is obviously um, the, the, a, a, a major theme of our, you know, core vote pamphlet about that yeah. sense of you have to have enough of a common ground amongst the people who have voted for us so that if we end up in a hung parliament, there's some chance of that coalition of support sticking together. You know, yeah, and of people remembering what we're for and who yeah. we are. And therefore we can... The problem in the stuff coalition stuff was we just disappeared. Yeah, that's right. We just disappeared from view. No one could remember what we were for. Mm. And, um, and the reason why we have such a low degree of permanent support, of core support of people who, who identify with us, um, has to do with not being clear uh, when the spotlight is on us, what we're in favour of. Mm. And, and I think part of that, and I, I say this with only with the advantage of hindsight, because I certainly didn't twig to it at the time. And actually, I don't think other people really did either in the party, even those who were very critical of Nick and coalition, was that... You know, we made one of our big things, the £10,000 income tax allowance, but fundamentally saying we're in power and therefore making the Tories cut taxes. That doesn't sound like a great achievement. I discussed this with Chris Butler on an earlier episode of the podcast that, you know, you, if you think about what the public expect the Tories to do, that doesn't didn't sound like we were getting the Tories to do something really different. For all that, yes, it's true that David Cameron had said in the TV debate that he didn't want to do this policy and therefore we, ha we genuinely did make him do something he wouldn't otherwise have done. The big picture was the Tories are in power, taxes have been cut. What have the Lib Dems really contributed? Yeah, and, and although it's a policy with lots of advantages and quite a good idea, uh, how does it relate to liberalism in any fundamental way? How does it reinforce the... Uh, the basic message of the party. I mean, they, 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 you can't just be a list of good ideas, no matter how good the ideas are. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you can tie it to our values to an extent in the sense that, you know, giving... Yeah, but this kind of thing has got to shine. It's got to be obvious. Mm. And, um, and I think the, pro the problem... If you need, if you need to explain it for half an hour, then it, it's, it, <laughs> it's, it's not the right kind of thing to achieve uh, the, um, the, the, the kind of recognition that you need. Yeah. And also the sort of freedom that cutting taxes gives people is, is an argument that libertarians and all sorts of people on the yeah. right make as well. So it, it, although I think it does fit with our values, it doesn't distinctively fit with our values and not with other people's values. Yeah. So, I'm not, so I'm not saying it's a bad policy. It's just that um, to make it your lead hmm. reason for thinking that, th that this whole project was a good idea, it's, it's very much lacking. Yeah. And, and, I mean, so Chris did a really interesting bit of research into, I don't know, he may even have interviewed you as well for it, about basically how the decision to stick with abolishing tuition fees stayed in the manifesto, how it was used during, or not used during the election campaign, but also why then did the negotiating team not sort of prioritise it? Um, and one of the points he made in that, which I thought was quite insightful, was that there was a reversal of what you normally find in political parties. So normally in political parties, and including in the Lib Dems on most occasions, you have the grassroots activists saying, this is the right policy to do, sod the electoral consequences, that's what we must do. And you have the party leadership saying, no, 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 we've got to be pragmatic about what the voters will want. Hmm. But on tuition fees, it was a role reversal because it was Nick Clegg and colleagues saying, <clears throat> no, we think in principle that's the wrong policy. This different education policy is the right one. And it was the grassroots activists who were saying, no, 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 this policy, yeah, that we, that's right. you know, we want yeah. the electoral pragmatism. Now, I guess you were one of those people very much when the policy committee was arguing over some of this stuff. You were very much in a lot of those debates. What was your what's your sort of take on why we had that role reversal? Well, um, it's all very puzzling, really. So, so there, there, there's a, I suppose the person to ask about this would be David Laws more than anybody else. I think he was uh, the, the, the force behind the, the idea that we shouldn't be in favour of our uh, policy on, on, on tuition fees. And the, the, 
so there are some you know, ideological reasons to be against it, um, that it redistributed in the wrong direction. And it's, it's, the better, it's the better off half of teenagers, essentially, that's right. who tend to go to yeah, university. But, yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, but then you, know, you, you can adjust the policy to make it um, do something different, and especially if you had a graduate tax policy, maybe that would be different. But the, 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 there just seemed to be a kind of strange mistake going on, which was that um, um, education policy was somehow um, separated out from other policies. So if you had a policy of spending more money on higher education, that by itself implied that you wouldn't spend so much mm. on uh, early years or primary. And the, lots of people want, wanted to emphasize early years and primary, nothing wrong with that, quite, quite a good idea. But to say that um, to finance that, you had to abandon the policy on higher education is just an error. I mean, you, you, the, the, the money is fungible. The, 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 the money for that can come from anywhere in government or from tax. So, 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 so that the, the, there's a kind of silo mentality of, in policymaking, um, which is carried over into government. Um, uh, the same kind of mistake was made over and over and over again in government. The, the, our, our ministers just thought about their own department. And, and the, 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 the main problem with that is who's at the centre, who's in the treasury? Those are the people who should be thinking about the whole pattern the whole pattern of government spending, the whole pattern of, 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 of taxation. Um, and we just didn't do it, basically. And, I mean, obviously that question about how do we best communicate our values, in a way, is very different when you're a small opposition party yeah. um, than when you're in coalition, although I think it's as important, if not maybe even more important now. Um, but what's your, so what's your take on what we need to do to get those sorts of things right in future. We've sort of touched on it a little bit in what we've sort of discussed so far, but just maybe to sort of address that sort of head on. What's, I mean, what would be, if you were to pen an email to Ed and you partner with this afternoon, what would you be telling him to do? Well, notoriously, I'm very bad at this political messaging stuff. So I'll kind of leave that to you, Mark, you know, how, how to express this. Um, the The... The key thing, I think, in the strategy is that we, we need to, um, at all times, think about the, the short term in terms of the long term. And that's to say that uh, when, when a political issue comes up that we want to intervene on, we've got to be saying things that fit our long term view of ourselves. And, 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 that, and that's the way to, um, to be authentic. You know, if, if you just come across as just saying stuff because that's what the interviewer wants people to say, then, yeah, you might you know, get a few extra seconds um, on the air, but you won't say anything to persuade anybody. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the question is, um, who are we, what, where are we going in the long term, and how does that relate to the issues uh, that come up? So that you, you, you always try to get across what your, your basic values are. Um, there was a time when... Um, uh, Gerald Kaufman, when he was a um, Labour Party um, uh, front bencher in opposition, used to get on everybody's nerves by um, uh, starting every answer in the interview. What the Labour Party stands for is. You know, what we in the Labour Party believe is. It's very annoying. Uh, but it, did get, it kind of worked. You know, it got, got the message across of what, of, of what the starting point was. And why, pe why are you saying what you're saying? It's, it's actually quite important, I think, in persuading people that they understand why you're saying what you're, you're saying. You have to kind of explain yourself. Mm. And I think we're very, very, very bad at, 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 at why. Uh, we, we just assert uh, policies mm. uh, if they're self-evidently correct um, or will attract support from the kind of people who mm. support that kind of thing already. Um, but, but, but saying why, I think, is really important. We don't say why enough. Mm. And, and obviously with some policies, it's relatively self-evident, but with a lot of policies, you know, it's not immediately... Well, I don't think it is self-evident. I, I, I think we think it's self-evident, but it's not. I mean, what, why is it a good thing to have a different voting system? Mm. Now, why? Um, uh, what, why is it a good thing to um, be worried about inequality? Why is that uh, important? Yeah, I, I mean, the sort of policy I have, 
had in mind were, you know, if we were, um, uh, well, the legalization of same sex marriage, I think would be one example, um, or, you know, investing in renewable energy. I think in both. Well, no, no, them, even those, even those. Um, if you want to avoid um, just um, uh, uh, preaching to the converted, you've got to explain why. Hmm. Um, so so um, same-sex marriage, you've got, to have, you've got to say why it's a bad thing to uh, uh, treat people badly uh, and unequally mm. in a way that, 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 that's uh, humiliating and awful mm. um, in terms of people's life. You've got to explain that. So the, 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 the reader of the Daily Mail, who might be inclined not to agree with it, uh, could see there's a reason for it. And, and, the, and the reason isn't just to uh, kind of uh, annoy readers of the Daily Mail. Mm. So, 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 so you, you, you've got to say why, even for the most obvious thing. Even renewable energy, you've got to say why. What, what, you know, comes back to climate change, mm. got to keep saying why. Mm. And I think we just assume too easily that the, um, the only people listening to us are ourselves, and therefore we need to explain ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not quite convinced on, on a couple of those examples where I think... E if people pay enough attention to politics to notice us saying something where I, I think on some issues you can make the, the, the conclusion as to why people will be doing it. But I absolutely agree with you on the bulk of stuff, such as if we're talking, if we're calling for better rail services, you know, there's a whole host of different motivations behind that. Yeah. And indeed there are people from all parties who call for it. And unless you're bracketing some of that in there for, why we think that particular yeah, right. investment is the right one it's just you're just another political yeah. voice how right. different you're just adding to the noise yeah um and actually there's a re there's a really good example in a way of i think how even quite cross-party policies like that i mean you know support for better rail services is a fairly you know you'll get every, people in every party who are very keen on that but you can frame it in a in a very liberal way. There's a good example with what Councillor Lisa Smart and colleagues are doing up in Stockport at the moment, where they're using uh, actually some of the funding for area committees, so the sorts of money that more often gets used yeah. on maybe things like plant pots in the high street and the like. They're using that to subsidise a local rail service, <laughs> and actually there's a there's a real sense then there of it, you know listening to what is going to make the most difference. To people's lives in that community and what is yeah. going to make their lives better on a day-to-day -day basis and that's yeah. the thing that should be prioritized yeah uh, that you know a, a, a an area committee focusing on local people's lives doesn't have to just be then about street level type solutions important though they are you know valuable yeah, right. though they can be but 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 that's it's a sense of starting with well, what matters most to people in our area Right. And you'll be glad to know, you know, part of the reason legally they're able to do that is the general power of competence. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, Which is a, I guess we could claim that as a coalition achievement, that legal power, probably, couldn't we? So, because I don't think Absolutely. it would have happened without the little <laughs> influence. Yeah. It's slightly technically, um, you know, not quite straightforward, but never mind. Yeah. Yeah. And right. certainly we introduced a general power of competence is unlikely to be much of a vote winning slogan in itself. But that sense of actually, you know what, people locally should be able to get on and do what they want to do yeah. without yeah. some set of rules and regulations in Whitehall saying no. You know, there is a there is a way of framing that. Yeah, that's right. In so, such that it explains what we're about. Yeah. Um, OK, so if, if that's the sort of, the you know, we've touched a bit on sort of party strategy and sort of attitudes towards Labour and the Conservatives a little bit on the sort of the why, you know, the why and the, the, uh, the Lib Dems are relevant and so on. Um, I guess the other element is the sort of just the more um, mundane one, but really important about how do we make ourselves just more effective as an organization and effective as a party you know we've got a huge number of members who have joined within the last few years who um whose levels of engagement in the party vary massively and actually we can be less good at applying our sort of principles about public involvement uh to to, to how we operate internally um so do you have any sort of because because you obviously one of the other things you have been in the past as a council leader as well so you've seen politics from lots of different angles 
if if you were doing a, an email not for Ed but for Mike Dixon, our CEO, what, is there anything you'd particularly pick out as you know to bring our values to life in terms of how we operate as a party? In that sense, to demonstrate by doing um, that we don't do well enough or don't do at all at the moment. Well, I think we don't listen very much. Mm. I mean, the the the, the, well, the centre of the party doesn't listen. Now, but but uh, Mike knows this already, so so this wouldn't be an email to Mike. Uh, this would be an email supporting what Mike's trying to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, the, we're not very good at, at listening to feedback centrally. We um, don't make it a, a, a part of political practice to, 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 to find out what it is that's on people's minds inside the party. I mean, the, the obvious things that we do, or at least used to do, um, in local government was, was to make sure that we're listening all the time. To, mm. As you were saying, to what, what, what would make people's lives better um, locally? And you can only do that by finding ways of, of, of talking to people where they get to talk. Yep. <laughs> it's as simple as that. They get to talk, you get to listen. Mm. And um, if you talk to enough people, you can start to see patterns of that. And so, it, so it's, it, it's about just providing opportunities for people centrally in the party to listen and to take seriously what they're hearing. I mean, not, not to say that um, uh, people are always right. I mean, local residents might have um, uh, some really daft ideas about how things could actually get better, but, but nevertheless, you've got, to, you've got to hear it and you've got to think mm. about um, you know, if people have got the wrong method for improving things, at least that you know what they want to improve. Yeah. And the same with, with party members. Um, I mean, I was on the, the review committee and there were you know, thousands and thousands of responses and some were really... It's on the Dorothy Thornhill. As it's now known <laughs> as a report, but many people other than Dorothy put a lot of hard work yeah, in. No, there are a lot of work other than Dorothy on it. And uh, you know, there's a wide variety of views. Uh, but even people, even when someone says something which, which, which you thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. Um, You've got to think about why they said it, what it is that's on their mind, what's going wrong. And you can, you, even people whose suggestions for improvements don't make a great deal of sense, you can learn a lot from what it is they want to be improved. Yeah. So you've got to listen. Yeah, and that's certainly something I'm trying my best to do. So I will include in the show notes a link to my feedback form if any members are listening and they have any feedback they want to make sure I hear, I'll include the link to that. Um, but just before we wrap up, David, um, because you're probably one of the best read members of the Lib Dems, I suspect. But I know quite a lot of listeners like reading uh, and learning more about politics and so on. So what's the best thing you've read, heard or seen about politics in the last year that you think, oh, if a listener hasn't, hasn't read or seen that, I'd really recommend they go and take a look. Well, it's interesting. I don't, I don't really read a lot about politics, um, except for work purposes. Um, so... Um, uh, which, which requires me to um, uh, read a lot of terrible autobiographies by Conservative Party leaders. And, and <laughs> um, <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend any of those. I mean, there's, there's lots of you know, little nuggets in there, but, 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 but the, the values of reading machine is very low. Um, so I think that the things I, I, I read and enjoy to relevant politics are, are mainly about other things. I mean, um, um, there's a... I have a colleague in Cambridge called Jonathan Aldred, who um, uh, put out a book called The License, License to be Bad, um, How Economics Corrupted Us. And it's all about um, different aspects of 20th century, mainly economics, and the dogmas of it, and especially public choice theory, and how they just led us down some very dark paths in, pub, in terms of public policy and how we've got to free ourselves from that. And basically how we've got to uh, 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 reform economics. Mm. So the economics needs to go back to thinking properly about the world uh, rather than about itself. So it's a, so it's a, um, um, a tremendously uh, good read um, if you're interested in public policy because you'll see the, the connections between these economic dogmas and what people say and do in, 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 in the policy debates. Um, and also, it's a, it's a great lesson in, in, in um, uh, Keynes's uh, dictum about uh, practical people, no matter how practical, are always enthralled to some defunct economist. <laughs> and you can spot the defunct economist that people are enthralled to in the book. So I think that was a, that was a really good book. Um, and then, um, I mean, going a bit further back, uh, another 
Cambridge colleague David Reynolds um, uh, wrote a book called Island Stories. It was a historian. And it, 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 it's about basically about myths uh, of British history and um, how they're very powerful in contemporary politics and um, how it's important to rewrite the stories to get them straight and to, to, to um, 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 think about why the myths became the myths and the effects of the myths on, on contemporary politics. You know, for example, um, what, why do we think uh, the Battle of Britain in 1940 is the big event in the Second World War, as opposed to the fall of Singapore, mm. which is probably more important in global terms than, 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 than anything else. Because one of them was a victory and one was a defeat. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and, and, one, is, and, and, you know, one is something to look back on with pride and the other isn't. Yeah, although though other national myths are based on defeats, whereas based on victories. So it's mm. kind of interesting. Uh, but anyway, so it's a very interesting book. Um, and then I, I, I do... I, um, read a lot of history. So um, um, I, I, there's William Dalrymple's book on the East India Company, the, 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 uh, what was it called? The, um, the Anarchy. Mm. Um, that's a really fascinating book. Yeah, I've, I've not read that myself, but I've, I keep on mean it thinking maybe I should add that to my to read list. You should. I've heard should. lots of good things it's, about it's, it. It's, not, it's a very good read. It's, it's, it's also rather terrifying. Um, of the, the, the rise of a private company with so much money that it managed to get itself a private army and conquer uh, 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 you know, half a continent mm. and behave very, very badly. You know, corrupted domestic politics, um, trying to introduce racism in, 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 into uh, British policy. It was an awful, awful episode. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, uh, well worth reading for itself for the history, not just for the contemporary. So, brilliant. I will. Um, um, I suppose oh, you've got one more. The nearest to politics, I think, you quite, I quite enjoyed. There's a book by Albert Weil um, on the will of the people, a myth, another myth, um, which lays out very clearly, um, you know, far too reasonably, I think, to, 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 to have any effect on politics. Uh, <laughs> far too reasonably, <laughs> while the whole idea of the will of the people is, is nonsensical and mythical and doesn't... Um, really refer to anything and how you need politics and democratic politics to be realistic about um, you know how we make decisions and not um, base itself on on mythical nonsense and it's a really good book but i say it, it's um, it, it's probably too reasonable um, and well argued to have any lasting effect on the political debate. I, I fear that sentence could be only altered slightly to refer to the liberal democrats as <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah, but on that note, thank you very much, David. I will include links in the show notes to all four of those books, as well as follow ups uh, to various other bits that we've discussed during the show, including that earlier podcast episode with Chris Butler talking about tuition fees. Um, I'm aware that in this episode, we've probably ranged a little bit more into political philosophy and foreign affairs than usual. So listeners are very welcome to send me feedback whether you've liked that, whether you'd like more or less of that in future episodes, you can find me on Twitter at Mark Pack, this podcast at Bar Chart Podcast. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Till next time. Mm -hmm.